Our guest today on the Change Exchange, given Kari, how should I describe you? Media entrepreneur, maybe? Passionate South African. Passionate South African? Yeah. Okay. Who happens to practice a passion in media. Okay, great. How are you? <laughs> Very well. Good. Good to see you. Still Indeed. Young, fresh and sexy. Thank you. <laughs> you grew up in Limpopo. Mm. Tell me about that. I grew up in the most beautiful part of the world. Uh, and I get to appreciate it more now that I've you know, grown up and I'm not spending as much time as home. Well. When you drive to Limpopo, it's a place called Davos uh, uh, Kloof. Okay. Um, it's between Sanin and, and, and Polakwan. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very hilly. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful vegetation. When I get there, I open the windows to Mahubas Kloof in particular. Davos Kloof is further up, Mahubas Kloof. And you just smell God's presence. Mm -hmm. So that's where I come from. And then there's past town, more towards the villages, and you still see a view of the some parts of the Drakensberg. And I grew up surrounded by mountains and a lot of uh, sounds of livestock and mm -hmm. music and rural, rural yeah, background. Yeah, I'm a proper, proper rural. I'm a rural boy. I'm a, I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a farm boy, I'm a rural boy. I grew up in a very honest environment where, where people are Unhappy, they let you know, and everybody knows. And when they embrace you, they embrace you fully. So and then you ended up in advertising. Yeah, transitionally, <laughs> transitionally. I, I'm a teacher by profession. Okay, did my, you teach? For 30 days, yes, as part of my practicals for me to get my, my degree. Um, but I love teaching. I, I grew up being surrounded. I mean, the most happening people in my environment when I grew up were teachers, and policemen, and occasional guests. And, one or two doctors here and there. So teachers were the most visible, most accessible that you could interact with at mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And my favorite people who also gave me a lot of confidence at a young age were teachers. So I loved teaching and that's what I wanted to do for the most part of my life. Straight after university, you in South Africa, you went to New York. Yes, I did. Uh, what was that like, getting to New York from rural Limpopo? Yeah. How did you experience it? Uh, it was affirming in that so growing up in Zanin, going to Teflop, while you're at the university, you still do a bit of work in Jersey. I uh, worked for, a, for SAA and the city of Johannesburg as an intern and go back to, to varsity. So I, I wasn't that green in my uh. rural nature. I'd been exposed to, to the big city, so to speak. But arriving in that environment as a student, I, it, was, it was amazing for me. One thing that I noticed, certainly from an academic point of view, was that our, my level vis-a-vis -vis the students that I was uh, in the same lecture rooms with, we actually had a much decent education in terms of exposure, a world outlook. So I didn't arrive in a place that was very intimidating from an academic point of view, but I was very much in a hurry to work. So I got in there and within the first month or two had negotiated with my lecturers to allow me to cut down my days in class so I can do the city work. Working so at working. what? What did you do? Broadcasting media. I worked for a company called Inner City Broadcasting, which had two radio stations, uh, one called WBLS, another one called LIB. And then with a bit of time, I joined Sony Entertainment in the Artist Management Division. And then during fall, I would go down to the West Coast and work for um, a movie house called Castle Rock Entertainment that a lot of people should know about. So I, I got a nice exposure to the overall media space beyond just uh, beyond radio. Chinoa Achebe was a mentor. Yeah. What are your memories of him? Um, grace, patience, an amazing listener. Um, humility. He, he, never, he never behaved like Chinua Achebe. He was a father of a young African son. He's a fellow African from Nigeria. He lived in the US for quite a while and was my lecturer as well in literature but adopted me you know me and my other colleague who was from South Africa as well and treated us as, as his sons and him and son and wife just gave us a home away from home and um, a lot of wisdom a lot of wisdom what an amazing experience yeah, hmm? lessons, big for, lessons. A, for a young man big lessons. Yeah. Yeah. but I'm sitting here thinking so many young people say I don't know where to start mm -hmm. I don't know how to get that first in mm -hmm. How did you manage that? What, what kind of um, advice can you give? 
I guess it will depend on what the start means. I mean, as, as I grow up, I, I ask myself, if, if, if one was to define a turning point in one's life, what would that be? And what I'm finding is that there is every, every, every year, every month, but frankly every day, it's an opportunity, it's a legacy creation opportunity. And, and the question is, what stage of your life are you at? So if you talk to me about where do you start believing you are worthy of something, if there's a moment I'm sitting on my mother's lap, I'm probably about 10, and I sneeze like crazy in Zanin, uh, I think 1984, and she says to me, are you going to sneeze like that in Parliament? You're so loud. Now, this is apartheid South Africa days. My mother went up to standard two, so to go to grade four. Um, we have no sense of parliament other than obviously the, um, the homeland parliament. And somehow this woman treats me as a parliamentarian or tells me how to behave in preparation to lead. So, so that would have been a turning point where somebody instilled confidence. And you, it's unbelievable, subconsciously, you start behaving like the person you are told you are supposed to become. So it builds confidence. Um, coming to varsity, coming from Zanin, interacting with guys from Jove, Cape Town, and Devon, and a rural boy, you walk in there as an equal. Uh, and anybody who comes from uh, some of those places, uh, you can easily be intimidated by this urban boy uh, <laughs> arriving in those environments. Yeah. But I walked into Tough Rock like a leader because my mother told me I was worthy of. And so, so, you know, and, and then it just grows from that. So, for me, the starting point. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a moment is about just taking in any moment of affirmation. When somebody says, you know, Rita, you're beautiful, just take it in. Because you start experiencing that beauty and you start you start expanding it. You start living it out. So some people are very dismissive of compliments. They go, ah oh, come on, you're just being nice to me. Very skeptical. I take it in. And you use it, you build on it. It yeah. builds you. Yes. You know, absolutely. it builds you. You take it in. If you take it in, uh, if you internalize it, yes. it becomes a part of you. It's whatever you put, stuff you put in, it's, that's what you're going to get out. So if, if there are moments that makes you feel good, there's a lot of crap in this world, so much rubbish and so much pain. And if, and if your mindset is easily, it, it's able to internalize the pain and the negativity, it becomes very difficult to take in the positive stuff. So mm. you got to consciously take that good day, that good conversation, that good check and that good experience and own it. Decide what you focus on. Absolutely. So advertising. Mm. Um, you, were, you were a director of the Jupiter Drawing Room and one of the founders of the communications firm. That's right. How did that happen and what did that mean in your life? The, the, the aim for us had always been to be media owners, but as you well know, been? myself and my business partner. Uh, the, the, the owning media in this country, as a matter of fact, in almost every other part of the world, media assets are regulated assets. So even if somebody gave you lots of money to do this, go and buy media, media owners do not sell because assets in media, particularly regulated assets, are hard to come by. Advertising for us was the most, the closest space we could be in while we were working for, waiting for change to happen at a regulatory level. So we had been clear from the onset, you get into advertising, it brings you closer to the space, it drives the commercial aspects of media, um, but also done correctly, it's a very good cash generative business if it's done correctly. And on the back of that, we're going to build an, you know, an asset base, which at a good time when South Africa was ready for us, we could uh, apply into media. And that's exactly what happened. And it is precisely for that reason that having built now South Africa's second largest uh, radio network after the SABC, we're able, ABC to say, exiting advertising. And we are about advertising. So you were always, you always had your eye on the, on the yeah. bigger, big, yeah. bigger picture. First was to be yeah. a teacher. And then when the whole teaching thing didn't work out and uh, the media bug hit, that's always been the thing that I wanted to do. How did you experience the, the country changing almost under, under your feet? Mm -hmm. you, were, you were on the, uh, I almost have this picture of you were on a ball and you were just, it was rolling, but you were up there and staying up and 
going. You get inspiration from that. As a, as a black business person, there are a lot of black people who've done amazing things in business. So at a broader commercial level, at least you've got some people to look at like, wow, uh, it, it is possible. When did you start? Uh, working, I started working as a student, but in terms of incorporating our business, when I came back from the States, I worked for Kaya for six months as a full-time employee. And I resigned six months later and just kept on air and started a, a media consultancy PR business. When are we talking about? Uh, early 90s? Is, no, uh, I graduated in 97. I came back home in 97, so I started the business in 98. Uh, 98. Mm -hmm. So about four years after post-democracy. And then and by that time, you know, guys had done some great work. Mm. Uh, in many aspects of our industry. Um, so you had role models that you could look at and, and, and just get inspired by them. But the advertising space in South Africa has changed so dramatically. Yeah. If you look at advertising now, yeah. it's aimed at the black middle class yeah. to a very large extent. Yeah. If I think of 20 yeah. years ago, yeah. everyone in the ads were white. Yes. So you were part of that? You were part of that I want switch to believe, over? I want to believe we played a role. We certainly were not the first. I mean, guys like uh, Inchi Nila and, uh, um, and a whole lot of other guys who started Headboys would have certainly be the pioneers. You and them would have been the pioneers in advertising. As a matter of fact, when we got into advertising, almost all the major advertising agencies had uh, partnered with some black professionals. The Jupiter drawing room was probably one of the last ones to do an equity deal. The difference was most major agencies had partnered with very established, well-known, bigger business people. The Jupiter drawing room surprised everybody because they were young at that time, partnered with some of these young, you know, two young black boys who would no track record in advertising. But we were business people on the back of uh, our communications business that we built. And I think in partnering with us, what was even bolder is that while everybody was doing the typical a little hoi the daiki is 25% thing, Jupiter was bold enough to do a bigger deal. We bought 57% of the Jupiter drawing room um, within you know, a pay space of about eight months. And we're able to turn it around that it was a small little famous agency, but small in, you know, in terms of size and business. And within the six months after we took control of the agency, one major clients, uh, you know, SAA, MTN, APSA, mm -hmm. Sasol, uh, about 1.3 billion rand worth of billings in six months from something that used to turn over a good 30, 40 million rand. So, so that sure. I think got industry to pay attention. By the way, billings, billings, not, not revenue. So I'm not saying we need 1.3 billion <laughs> that type of money. But the most important part of it was that it didn't do a BEE deal with Ducky sitting in the corner yeah, yeah. hearing from the blues. It sold, and we paid for it, to black people who took More over than the half. board mm. and took over the management. Mm. And some of the original founders continued as employees and minority shareholders in our business and worked as partners. And I think that's what worked amazingly for the business. And then the, the shift into radio, Capricorn was the first one, right? Yes, yes. Capricorn was an amazing story. I mean, coming from Limpopo, um, having started Radio Turf, which is the first campus-based radio station in South Africa to be licensed by the then IBA, we, we knew the market of Limpopo. We understood radio like crazy. And when the application, when ICASA decided for the first time that they were going to license a commercial radio station in Limpopo, we were like family focused on it. And we put in a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money to prepare for the application. And we were blessed enough, I think, in 2006 to win the license. And we launched it in uh, November 2007. And what's the secret of the success? That you know the market? Yes, I think it's insights, as is the case with every business, you know. I mean, you look at the people behind Bright Rock. These are practitioners in this space. I don't think that you can build a sustainable business if you don't surround yourself or if it's not led by people who are very passionate about it. Most importantly, who understand the drivers that makes that business work. But not just the trade, but the, the broader macroeconomic environment that will determine whether that business works or not. And so Capricorn is based on one simple insight. It's so easy, it's not funny. Limpopo is one of the few provinces that still has a larger spread after Hawaii of various language groups. So you've got uh, Sipedi speaking people, Venda speaking people, Shanghai speaking people, a few Africaners, and a few Indianers in Limpopo. 
And if you look at the geography of the province, all of these language groups are sitting in some corner of the province. And the major radio stations in that place is, are also according to language, African language stations. So for Pedis, Tolela, for Shagans, yes. And Capricorn's proposition was South Africa has moved forward. While it's important to celebrate and highlight our languages, there's a certain tertiary level at which the black middle class are laid to. And that is beyond the language. It's aspirational, it's about self-development, it's about leading your lives, etc. You want a medium that unites people at that level beyond just language and beyond the core of the region. So all we did was to give the people of the province something that they can collectively and individually own irrespective of which corner of the province they come from and what language they speak. And now you've started Power FM in Johannesburg against yes. the big boys. Mm -hmm. And you know they're not taking kindly. I'm sure. The big boys are hard at work. But that inspires us. Um, you know that you're up to something when when the establishment moves and responds and reacts. Um, power has been subjected to a whole lot of nonsense, literally, in the media, operationally, uh, in terms of signal, like everything you can think of has been thrown at us. Uh, the passionate people that work in that organization keeps it going. The proposition as well is not too different from Capricorn. It looked at South Africa and it says that if you look at, once again, I mean, the core of our business, the offering in the moon, we're targeting the market of the future, which is the black man class, unapologetically so. Our view is that if you look at the, um, the transitional story of South Africa, a lot of it has been very kumbaya based, it's been honeymoon based, rainbow nation, we all love each other, let's hug, let's dance, etc. And it was necessary at the time of transition. It's been 20 years now, certain truths are starting to come out fact that you know the economy is still dominated by a few people who happen to be of a similar skin color accident hello two that the politicians or the uh, there's, there's a growing level people are becoming vocal about that's not what I voted for these are not my expectations three more and more individuals are realizing they can take the role of the individual to do something about their lives, to change one, the status quo of their families. And as they gain power in their individual basis, they become more confident to pronounce about how they feel about how they want to be treated in a restaurant, how they want to be treated at schools, at a hospital, even by government. Those people, we believe, are the people that needs to be aggregated into a power group that can transform society, not just for the sake of this town, but also for the rest of the continent. So power believes that the black middle class in the main have got a lot to say, but the, the bulk of the media platforms in this country are not meant for them, they're not designed for them. On the music front, the assumption is that if you're young and you're black, you know, professionally, you just want to dance. You know? So black people have been given music stations, right? On the other extreme, those one or two top platforms that are there accommodates that audience. They're not designed for them. You know, it's like, really, you know. It's not the main focus. It's not the main focus. You, you and I know, right? When I come to your house tomorrow, you will decide what time I'm going to eat, what I'm going to eat, what time I'm going to eat, and when I'm going to have music, what time the party starts, and when the party ends. So you may treat me beautifully, mm. like a guest. Mm. But, I but know it's on my terms. It's on your terms. And we took a view that there's nothing platform in this country that is deliberately designed for this market of the future we are going to determine what happens to the rest of the African continent. But we also realize that their quest is not just to be entertained, but they have a lot to say. And so what we try to do is to create a platform mm. to hear what the ultimate influencer of South Africa in years to come has got to say, but also to get them to be accountable Mm -hmm. that instead of sitting back as recipients of policies or as a recipients of racism or recipients of circumstances to challenge them to say you are the leader you are looking for so power is about creating a platform primarily for the black middle class in Gauteng, the biggest economy in south africa and therefore by extension the continent to get these people to understand that wherever mm -hmm. this country goes 
It's going to be on my attempt, or has going to be in the attempt. So they have to take responsibility and lead. So are you going to make it? We are making it. We are. Not I can only cheer company. you on. I, I mean, because all you say but, sounds but you know perfect. I mean? Listen to the station. People ask me, have you manufactured these people? Where have these people been? And I said, no, they've been around. All they needed was a platform that treats mm. them with respect, that assumes that they are smart, and that uh, black people have been told that they suffer from a culture of entitlement, that these people are still carrying a lot of pain. And yet, in spite of that pain, they wake up every day, they go to work, they create mm. businesses, they run, you know, they're in strategic roles in the public service, in the private sector, everywhere else. But somebody just needs to say, we are worthy, and here's a platform. Say how you feel and what you think. And that's what power is about, and that's what it does every day. You've now also acquired commercial uh, 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 licenses in the Eastern Cape and in the Free State. Free State yes. Those markets, are they, are they big enough? Are they rich enough? No, they are called secondary markets. So, you know... Certainly, the, the economy of this country, as you know, it's still very much the metros, uh, mm -hmm. the, the primary regions of Gauteng, um, Western Cape, and KZN, and just the, the size of industry in those places. But there are people in the Free State, in the Eastern Cape, in the Bobo, in the Northwest, who consume products every day, who spend. So, relative to the major towns, no, they're not as big but um, anchored by a major asset like power and the track record of Capricorn as a combination, it's a lethal combination. So when you look at the footprint of all our four stations, we essentially will be in seven of the nine provinces in South Africa. So we actually will be the second largest radio network after the SABC post the launch. And all of them looking at you know stimulating those people that I described in the past. And they're there in all those regions. Not as big as Gauteng, but certainly, I mean, when we applied for Capricorn, the industry said um, it's a small little town. And now it's become one of the most successful commercial radio mm -hmm. stations in South Africa. So, so it's, it's, a, it's an exercise of aggregation. It's uh, the power of one type of a proposition. How important is it? Because it, it's, what you say is so striking for me. Mm. How important is it for an organization to have that kind of vision that you are formulating. That's right, yeah. It's, it's, it's about that. I mean, this That this everyone must follow the same star. Yeah, it's critical. Yeah. You know, for a country, it's critical for, for a family. It's critical everywhere. And it shouldn't be as difficult because, you know, as human beings, we are motivated by similar things. I don't care if you're male, female, black or white. The expression or the emphasis may vary from one community mm. to another, but we want the same things, you know. So it's about understanding, one, as an organization, what our reason for being is, if we are a trucking business vis-a-vis -vis a broadcasting business, but also understanding how we're going to do it differently from others. Uh, but ultimately, I think if it's done from a place of honesty and truth, it tends to align you with your overall this might sound too spiritual for other people. It's fine. It aligns you to your calling, to your purpose, mm -hmm. to your reason to be. I, and, and, I and if you believe in that stuff, and yes. I certainly do, and certainly most of the people that I work with believe in alignment and in a thread and having a reason to wake up beyond just money and understanding that you know if it's done properly, it brings us to money. And as the money comes in, hopefully reinvest in, into growing it. If that's the language mm -hmm. that you speak, certainly for us it works. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can't speak on behalf of everyone else, but I believe in that. I spoke to this amazing doctor in mm. Port Elizabeth mm. who works in one of the townships there. And he said, you point your heart in the right direction and everything follows. I have to believe that. In being a serial entrepreneur, as you've been, does one have to be a kind of risk taker? Do you have to have the ability to step off the edge? Yeah. You know, I move from... Definition of risk sometimes quite worries me. I, I don't know if I'm a risk taker. I, I, I don't know. I doubt I'm a risk taker. I because you believe so firmly that it yeah, will work. Yeah. Mm. I invest a lot of time and effort before I do stuff. So I possibly am a coward with conviction. Right? So, no, I don't take risk well mm. enough. Once I believe, though, I go the whole nine years. And maybe that's what people's definition of risk is. I think also the other definition of risk for other people is to what extent do you back yourself? 
and I do, and, and I'm surrounded by people who do as well. What do you mean, back, back yourself? Back yourself, i.e., to go against the grain, to go against um, what popular view is on something. And, and to put everything on the line. And just hoi it, yeah. Mm. yeah. No, absolutely, not do that. So if that's risk, it's critical. But for me, at the back of risk, is going to be a lot of homework. Right, because cause <laughs> it's a thin line between taking risk and being irresponsible, you know, being naive and stupid. So you, you do your homework until you believe in the core of you, all things considered, that it will work. And if it doesn't, that you will be able to, to reconcile it with you and try yes. again. Yeah. And so I think risk, it's, it's, it's a judgment call. It must be, it's a consideration that must be applied with a lot of thought. And yes, here's the funny thing about conviction and belief is that even when everything else would suggest or point out to it not happening, there's still that deep thing in you that says, no, it's worth it. Let's go for it. Mm. And, and, and just pray to God with all the efforts that things go according to plan. Mm. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's about believing. It's about believing, but belief must be informed by something. Mm -hmm. And if you ask people, why do you believe in Jesus? They say, no, he died for us on the cross. That for them is a reference point. If you ask some of another religion, why do they believe? They are able to give a reason why that is the case. So in order to believe, there's got to be something that you can sus substantiate that mm. makes sense to you. Mm. It doesn't follow, though, that those that you're preaching to will buy. In the same way in any religion, it doesn't follow that if you tell them about Allah or Jehovah or whatever, that they will believe. But those who believe, we do everything for that which they believe in. So mm. vision for me is going to be centered on something that is believable from a place of auth authenticity and hopefully with a much bigger um, um, cause that you have in mind. When you start that political party, I'll sign up. All right. What shall we call it? The, <laughs> the I believe party. <laughs> Let's change the subject slightly. Tell me about your wife. How did you meet her? Why did you decide that she was the right one? I was told that men don't choose women. I'm told we get chosen. Oh, okay. You're lucky. I'm told we get chosen. No, but my <laughs> wife, just a funny story. I used to be a, uh, a talk show host at Kaya. And my producer suggested this young lady for me to interview. So she gave me the profile of this young lady. I looked at her and I was like, nah, too light, not interested. And I had this big uh, figure, business figure that I plan to interview the day. And at about four or five, that person canceled. Us. And I was desperate. And I said to my producer, um, where's that young alternative? You know this is a broadcaster. So I ended up with this young lady that, in my view, was not worthy <laughs> of an interview in my studio. <laughs> and, um, was a one hour show, first 30 minutes was a proper business interview, and the last half an hour was interviewing for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so you decided yeah. there and then? Yeah, I was not. Really? Was a no, seriously. And the amazing thing is that when I, when I uh, knocked off, I got a call from an uncle of mine who said, who's that young lady you were talking to? She sounds very interesting. My business partner called me immediately after that and said, that woman that was in the studio sounds like your wife. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, I invited her to my office, and she arrived at the reception. And and my business partner came back to me to say, do you remember the other night when you were in radio? And I said, that was your wife? I said, yes. I, said, no, I was wrong. That was not your wife. Your wife is at the reception. <laughs> and it was the same person. How did she feel? So she tells me a few weeks later that, now this time we're, we're dating now, that, um, the same night, her best friend called her to say, you know, I wish I could have told you, please date my friend. <laughs> and then a few months later, um, she says to her father, there's a friend I want to introduce you to. And the father said, let me take a guess, it's the guy on the radio. <laughs> so it seems that those who are closer to us... You have must have been flirting yeah, too. Like crazy. <laughs> like crazy. So I asked her... On air? Yeah. In public? The, oh, yes. Oh, yes. One of the questions I asked her was, I asked him, does she have any pets, any dogs, <laughs> any children, <laughs> you know, da, 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 da. No, no, I, I, was, I was literally, uh, yeah, she hit me literally in that studio. And but she's a, a businesswoman in her own right. How do you make 
time for each other? How do you find the time to build a relationship? Yeah, it's it's not easy. Mm. Um, she's she's gotten much better than I've been um, in it. Um, she spends a lot of time uh, at home with the kids. She challenges me in many respects to do fun stuff. I come from mm. Zanin. Things like movies and going to the beach and holidays. That's like a lot of work, right? <laughs> so she's taught me as well. Uh, yeah. We call it the bon vivoire, the good life. Um, of family. Now, but on a serious note, I mean, we're both, wh- one thing that brings us together is that we're both very intense family people. So in my family, I'm the, um, I'm the person who brings everybody together. Your best family. Yeah, yeah my, my family. And on her family side as well, she's been that person who brings it together. So that's one thing that we share very tightly. And now she's also taken over that role, even on my family side. She's the one who brings everybody together. Mm-hmm. When there's something good or something not so good, we probably will be the first people to know on both sides of the family. Mm-hmm. So we're very intense family people. The truth is, I, I'm not a street person, neither is she. So yes, we spend a lot of work at work, but outside work, we, we're family people in the main. Mm. Mm. Beautiful girls uh, that are highly opinionated who challenge us. There are four of them, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've got What's three, it like three to be wife, the, the three, only. Three from my wife and uh, one daughter from a previous relationship. Oh. Um, I'm surrounded by women. Yes. I was told it takes a man to make a woman. <laughs> so so <laughs> I, I'm spoiled. I'm surrounded by all this beautiful feminine energy. Left, right, and center. Uh, yeah. Is your. Parenting style different from what your par- how your parents treated you? I was brought up by women in the main. So I've had very few male, male figures in my life, certainly. Um, never really got to live with my father. So I um, spent a, bit of, a lot of time with uncles, but you know, on the periphery, young men, this and all that. Uh, my, my mothers, my aunts, all of them, I was brought up by a whole lot of other women. Mm. Um, they shaped me in many respects. Uh-huh. They were disciplinaries. Were they? No, proper. Mm. Uh, but uh, lots of love. I grew up with a lot of love. Mm. Lots of love. So, so that makes a big difference. You know, this, this country, I think, has a problem with absent fathers. Mm. Mm. How do you see the role of the dad? It's a big challenge, particularly as mm. a father of, of girls. I mean, I'm challenged. You know, my eldest daughter doesn't live with us. My wife challenges me all the time in terms of presence. I'm still an underachiever in that respect. It's a big challenge. And you can see women who grew up with a male figure in their lives and they was it a big difference. I think as men we have a lot of work what do you to mean? that respect. You, women who who grew up with father figures, mm-hmm. whether it's biological or not, I find them to be they tend to be a little more confident and in their ability to relate to, to men. To men, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so that gap, a lot of us as men, we still have a massive job to play. I, however, see though that the mother stem, like I spoke about myself, um, you, you just can't forget verbatim things that, yeah. that your mother has said or how she's done things mm-hmm. or how she used to do things. And, 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 and you check yourself as well, now as a parent, as to what extent are you either expanding or continuing to apply those things that you've learned, then the question becomes how applicable are they in today's world? And I think particularly to today's generation, it's a very challenging space to navigate where we're very competitive in the workplace. We all want to achieve, we all want to build, and yet we still want the same things. You wanna, and we want a warm home, you want to be a great father, you, mm-hmm. you want to be all those kind of things. That transitional space um, mm. is a challenging one for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. And how do you see the future for your daughters in South Africa? You know, many people are so negative about mm. this country, mm. white and black, mm. I think. Mm. I, I believe that my kids have got an amazing future in this country. Mm. It's not just going to come. I have to ensure that it happens. So, so take people, responsibility, both you and them. Absolutely. So people who have a, uh, a negative outlook to this country tend to be people who 
the family might have done a lot of good in getting their lives in a good space. They fear because they've got something to protect. Yeah. They have and too much to lose. They have got too much to lose. Then I ask a question. If you really feel like you've got too much to lose, what are you doing to ensure that you don't lose? Right. So let's stop outsourcing the future of this country to a few supposedly powerful people. Let's engage constructively. Let's be exemplary. And let's not assume that the people who spend all their lives fighting one of the worst systems of governance in this world, right? These people sacrificed their own families and relatives, went to exile, went to prison, come back, now have to run a country. Okay? One, give them bloody credence for the sacrifices they've made in their lives. Two, understand that they will not master everything. Mm. Right? But the more we create a diff distance between the rulers of this country and ourselves, the more we're waiting like spectators waiting for them to fail. I said, I knew it, like the rest of them on the continent. So my challenge is for every leader, whether it's at a school environment, there's some change that can happen at St. Stephen's, right? Mm. which is where my kids go to. I have a role to play there. I've not been as active, right? At church, mm. um, in the workplace, because this country is not just going to be changed at a political mm. level. It's about the every things sphere. that we do as society. Mm. And, and I find it, I struggle, for example, with guys who treat me, particularly my fellow white counterparts, who treat me differently by virtue of who I am, and I watch them when I visit them in their homes, how they treat their, their helpers. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and I see it. And trust me, every black person sees it. Mm -hmm. You might jolly and have a drink. I'm watching you. So it's about practicing this change that we preach mm. in our own small environments, at home, at work, and then it, it does affect the country. As it relates to government, uh, senior business leaders in civil society, we have a role to engage, to question, mm -hmm. to advise, to play a role uh, in the same way that we should do as well with politics. So, so yes, the country is going to the dogs if we remain passive. And, and this country is going places if those of us who are blessed with resources or influence, mm -hmm. irrespective of how small the spaces can play our role. And in the bigger scheme of things, I. I just believe we're going places. I mean, we've got massive challenges. There are warning signs here and there, yeah. as would be the case in most environments. But, yeah. but my, my kids Imagine living in America at the moment. <laughs> First the weather. Look, on a, quite, on a much lighter note, your home. Oh, How did you buy your present home? How did you decide on it? Why? Oh. Why? I was late for a meeting with the CEO of a bank. I used to live across the freeway on the other side, and I was stuck in traffic for a for an hour and a half on that particular day, and this CEO waited for me in our lobby. So everybody was watching why, who this big person is waiting for, and then comes given late. <laughs> so I was very embarrassed. I canceled my appointments for that day, and I looked for a house on the other side of the freeway. <laughs> Simple reason. I was happy to settle for anything if it's on the other side. Um, and I was blessed enough at the time that um, two years later, I was able to, uh, we as a family, were able to... Um, uh, after I had moved, after the birth of our third daughter, she was starting to be a uh, second daughter. She was starting to be, you know, able to handle it. So we moved houses, we moved the other old structure, and we started from scratch and we built ourselves a, a decent home. And what is the most important thing that you wanted? A study with big windows, a very nice kitchen if you cook. What's the one thing you want in a house? She wanted a huge kitchen. <laughs> And fancy bathrooms. I wanted an amazing, huge garden. Okay. I'm, I'm a rural boy, so my favorite place. Do you garden yourself? No. Kind. I, I supervise very actively. Yes, yes, yes. But yes. No, I don't do it myself. Yeah. I have to. Uh, at least occasionally. But no, you play. I play, I play with the pool. I play with the pool. <laughs> uh, my favorite space is sitting by the patio. Overlooking the the pool, and then it drops, and then there's this splash of greenery, mm. and all the flowers are out. That's mm. what I love the most about my home. It's, it's the garden. Over invested in the garden, um, and but but it's a very open space. It's a mm. Very open space. Love my home. Kevin, thank you so very much, and I hope you sit on your stoop 
for many hours and dream up new stuff. And as I say, when you start that party, phone me. Thank you so much. For because me. don't you think Thank he's you. next uh, tomorrow's politician to save us all? <laughs> Thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much.